Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is lecture in the history series number three on timelines of art history. I have five different kinds of timelines to talk about. Um, a couple of them experimental, the rest of them things you find in textbooks. So first of all, textbook timelines. The most common way to visualize, uh, visualize art history is with timelines, and most of the big one-volume art history textbooks come with timelines, big fold-out timelines, often online scrolling ones. This is one from Helen Gardner's Art Through the Ages. And some of them are online, like this one is also a scrolling timeline with links in it. Conventional timelines um, are always linear, but sometimes when they get too big, uh, they don't all fit on uh, into one fold-out chart or onto one uh, web page. The biggest of all of them, I think, is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City's Heilbrunn timeline, um, which is a permanent uh, site that they maintain. Um, it has essays about objects and also lists of periods and rulers and styles and things like that, and even has a few maps. There's no single timeline here, but some pages have several shorter timelines in them, which I'll show you on the next um, screen. It's a really good um, resource, um, and it's reliable, and it's written by um, good scholars, uh, but it doesn't work as a visualization. So this is just an example of that. It's a page that you can click on, and you end up with four different timelines uh, for this period, 1600 to 1650, with a map and links to images and text and so on. So it's a kind of a timeline that's become invisible because it's just too big. So. A good first step in customizing timelines to make them more like the way you might actually imagine art history to be going uh, would be to make the scale nonlinear. So this is an example of one, a nonlinear timeline uh, about the JFK assassination. And uh, the timeline expands, as you can see at the bottom uh, of the timeline, it expands right around the time of the shooting. So this is something that, in my experience, art history textbooks uh, don't do, but they definitely could, and they should, because there are periods, like, for example, the Renaissance or around 1900, maybe in the 1960s, where time definitely expands for art historians. Art historians think of time as, you might say, expanded or moving more slowly or being more detailed or more fine-grained in certain periods than others. So time is not linear in, in art history in professional art history, in the teaching of art history, uh, it's not linear, and it's certainly not linear in anyone's imagination. So most of this um, lecture is about ways to come up with timelines that could more accurately match uh, your imagination um, uh, of art history or the way that it's taught. So first of all, a little bit about pre-modern timelines, that is timelines before modernism. There's a kind of timeline uh, which I would like to call a map timeline. It was developed in the 18th century. And the idea of this is that time still runs left to right, um, but when cultures expanded, um, uh, when they got more territory, they would take up more space. Because um, as you could see, maybe on the right-hand margin, um, there's, it's labeled Italy, France, and so on. So when the Roman Empire expanded, it took up more vertical space. So they become a little bit like maps they're combinations of maps and timelines, you might say. Um, so that's a famous early one by Joseph Priestley, 1769. This is the most elaborate 19th century example of that timeline. I think it's Sebastian Adams' Synchronological Chart of History from 1881. There's a website where you can look at this in detail, but I'll just show you one microscopically tiny detail from a little bit of the, in, the, in the middle of it in a second. This, you can see cultures branching and then continuing. So the, the metaphor is sort of like roads or streams or something like that. And sometimes uh, uh, there's a phrase that's used in programming, event trees, that's used to describe these as well. So here's just a tiny detail of something way in the middle. You would get really lost in this kind of timeline, but that also kind of fits the way that you might think about artistry. You could get lost in little details here and there. And, Right in the middle, there's the hieroglyphic picture that means supposedly means doctor. Um, not, not that anybody would sort of need to know that. And above it and below it, these streams or roads of, um, in the bottom, it's Assyria, on the top it's Egypt, they go flowing by. There are also timelines made by artists, some as artworks. 
some of them to create alternative histories. Um, there was one that was uh, traveling internationally a few years ago um, that I saw in uh, Singapore where every, in every stop it was uh, redone on the walls of a gallery and people would add their own ideas to what should be uh, on the art history timeline. This one was one at the Tate Modern in London. And the idea was to create um, alternative histories, alternative narratives uh, that you wouldn't find in, in uh, textbooks. This is a Dada timeline. It was done uh, by the artist Francis Picabia. It's called the Dada Movement. Um, so Picabia made drawings and paintings of machines, and also he made machine-like drawings. He drew like a machine, and he drew machines as well. So this is a kind of hybrid machine plus um, timeline. The timeline um, swirls up the left-hand side, so you can see that better in this detail. Um, we can see some names of artists that he knew, um, and so time is running up along the, from the bottom of the picture. Um, and Picabi puts himself almost at the top. You can see his name there um, uh, below, the, below the black rectangle. Uh, but he attaches a clock that's wired up like a bomb to the Dada movement. And it's also wired uh, to a bell, which is out of this detail at the bottom, which he also signed. So it's actually a bomb alarm timeline. Sometimes the timelines try to mimic their subject matter with their style. So this is one uh, that shows design history, graphic design history timeline, inspired by Swiss style, it says. Of course, this can only work if the, all the art you think of belongs to one medium or style. Then you could try making a timeline in the style of the art that you study. I could imagine a fashion timeline, but it would have to be pretty homogeneous, like it can't be sticking in monuments and things wouldn't stick into it. So it would have to be um, all the same kind of art to be designed to the same way. Um, this one by an artist whom I don't know named Rama Hertzlein. Uh, it mixes art theory, which is up on top. At the very top, you can see names like there's Clement Greenberg at the top right. It mixes art theory with art. And art itself is divided into art on the far left-hand margin and consumer art, which uh, for Hertzlein is animation, comics, video games, but no television or movies. And you can see at the bottom, politics runs along the bottom of this. Um, and on the right um, are all the things that get omitted from art history survey classes. Um, so you could see tactical media, cybernetic art, postmodern sculpture, and uh, a bunch of other things. Lowbrow, <laughs> I don't know exactly what lowbrow is. Um, animation, video games, stuff like that. So um, this is a way, if you feel like drawing a timeline for yourself instead of an imaginative map, this would be a way to give yourself the freedom that it would require to really put it in the shape that you need. Because this, this is a pretty eccentric collection of sometimes made up movements. Like notice hacking exploratory and hacktivist art in green. And that list of theorists up at the top is pretty idiosyncratic. So this has the kind of freedom that it would take to make something uh, into an honest representation of how you feel about uh, arts. You could keep a timeline like this along with your world art history survey as a kind of diary and develop it as you go along, making things uh, bigger and smaller, shifting them around so they correspond with the way that you think. There's a whole um, category of timelines which take the form of trees. And this is maybe the most famous one. This is Alfred Bars. He was the curator at the Museum of Modern Art um, that we'll see in a few lectures. Um, this is a chart uh, that he made, which became very famous of modern art as he saw it. Barr is well known for inventing isms. Um, he actually had uh, isms, new names for isms that didn't exist, written on uh, note cards that he kept in his desk. And he tried many different forms of this chart before he settled on this. It was his idea uh, of how modern art was going at, in 1936. Um, and so the basic idea of this is that cubism, which you see on the right-hand margin about halfway up, that it leads to abstract art, which you see down toward the bottom. Above the title, Cubism and Abstract Art, which is the exhibition, above the title you see non-geometrical abstract art and geometrical abstract art. So you could also try something like this to see if by sort of branching trees you could find your own kind of connections, things that you think are connected and things that you think aren't. So there's a detail at the bottom. Um, so abstract expressionism on the upper left of this detail means Kandinsky, not Pollock, like it's come to mean. And in Barr's view, uh, the Bauhaus um, had 
Um, no particular um, in direct influence on art. You see Bauhaus just to the left of my caption there. Um, but now it's like 100 years later. It's almost 100 years after this uh, chart was made. And the Bauhaus is now recognized to have had significant influence on art school curricula, which we'll get to. Um, in 2013, the Museum of Modern Art decided to remake Barr's chart. Um, they used a computer database and software that maps affinities um, in order to take some of the same um, people in the same categories and to see how they quote unquote really are connected. Um, I find this kind of thing's not particularly helpful because it relies on criterion algorithms that aren't known to anyone except the people who programmed it. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not legible in that sense because the reasons for the length and the formations of the lines are not, uh, are not immediately known. Uh, but you could still have something like this as your mental map. And if you use this kind of software like uh, GraphViz, uh, G-R-A-P-H-V-I-Z is a free online tool that does this kind of graph. And it, you tell it what the connections are and it just rearranges the map to make the most um, condensed possible map. And it will surprise you. It will show you connections between things you didn't think were connected. Um, this is an artist named uh, Daniel Farrell, and this was his take on Barr's chart. Uh, so you see Barr's thing on the lower left. Um, and Farrell went and invented isms as well. He invented outsider graph, which he says is, quote, more idiosyncratic and unschooled than classic graffiti. And he invented tackers, which is a mix of tagger, attacker, and hacker, <laughs> who, uses, who use aesthetic-based tactics to break down the system. Um, so it's in the spirit of Barr, inventing isms uh, wherever they're needed. Here's another tree, um, a tree uh, diagram of art history. Covarrubias was a Mexican painter and an art historian, and he did this in 1933, so just a couple years before uh, Barr's chart. So the roots of the tree to Covarrubias are a mixture of 19th century French painters you can see the roots, Delacroix, Daumier, David, Poussin, uh, not all 19th century. Uh, but anyway, they, so they flower into Impressionism. Impressionists are the trunk of the tree as it goes up, and there are leaves sticking out of the, Impressionist leaves sticking out of the trunk. So that's not the usual art historical story. Like you wouldn't read in your survey text that those roots lead to that trunk and those Impressionists, but this is his idea. And then the trunk uh, splits into three branches of post-Impressionism. Cezanne's on the left, um, Syrah's the, the trunk that goes straight up, and uh, Gauguin and Van Gogh are the kind of double trunk, which is, goes off to the right, and that's actually kind of closer a little bit to the standard art historical narrative. But the really strange thing about this is that the tree is knotted. Uh, it knots, it, the, the branches grow back into a single knotted bridge or something. Um, and the idea of this for him was that he was forming a kind of um, base for surrealism. Um, you could see the word surrealism up at the top. Surrealism and Dadaism that go um, straight out of this sort of recombined, um, recombined branches. That's a really interesting way to think of a tree, that it can knot itself back together again. So it's not, an, it's not like a genealogical tree. Um, which keeps, um, you know, um, splitting, branching, exfoliating, but it actually knots itself again. This is uh, one of many cartoons made by Ad Reinhardt, who's a painter and sculptor as well as an art critic. Um, and uh, he drew a lot of satires of contemporary art. And this one's called How to Look at Modern Art in America from 1961. Um, it has some serious elements like the trunk of the tree is Brock, Picasso, Matisse. That's, you know, he's a serious, straightforward kind of thing. He's in, he was in favor of pure abstract painting. His own paintings, Ad Reinhardt's paintings, are hard edge abstractions. So that's what he's in favor of. Um, and on the, on the left side of the trunk, um, he puts that and he says that if you, you don't know anything about art, you could start in cornfields on the right side, cornfields. So here's a little bit of a close-up of that. So he, he was angry about things about um, art that he didn't like. So here on the close-up, you could see better that the trunk, um, right above where it says Brock, Matisse, Picasso, the trunk uh, is, has a whole band of names across. Abstraction is the good stuff on the left. 
And uh, social and surrealist work is the bad stuff on the right, and the really bad stuff is on this big overloaded branch that's about to crack and fall down to the cornfield where ignorant people live, apparently. Um, so his least favorite artists are corn plants, the names that are in the corn plants, and in front of them are some corporate sponsors, Life, Pepsi-Cola, <laughs> Container Corporation, Oil, Lucky Strike, Cigarettes, that kind of thing. Um, and notice also what's dragging this branch of bad art down, the branch that's about to crack. Um, it's, it includes figurative art and, its influ and, and also um, a weight called Mexican art, that is Rivera, Roscoe, and other muralists that he didn't like. Um, and some of those prejudices can still be found in art history. I mean, it may seem like this is the, you know, it's a cranky, satiric um, uh, piece by an artist, but actually the idea that Mexican art influenced, like people like, uh, like Orozco and so on, is a weight dragging art down, is actually something that occurs in a, in a not so satiric way, but still occurs in some contemporary art historical scholarship. So this, he's actually reflecting ideas of his time. Another um, artist's tree diagram, George Bacunas was a, was a fluxus artist um, and also a really serious student of art history. He has notebooks full of art historical um, um, notes that he took and, and, and all sorts of things, including other timelines and stuff like that. So this is just part of this larger document that he made of art movement since 1959. And fluxus, the movement he's associated with, is at the right, right about in the center on the right. It says fluxus group, you might be able to see. And if you can read these, you'd be, you, you would know that you'd see that very few of them are artists and movements that are part of art history. As um, he's got ballet in there and he's got all kinds of things like Wagner and so on that are not normally part of visual art history anyway, although they could easily be. So if you were to do a freestyle, tree style timeline, it could be like this with a variety of different cultural influences, Baroque theater and all the rest of that kind of thing. He's even got natural events on the upper right there. So it's even things that are outside the art world. But um, this is the way he, he imagined them as connected. And, and he's a very, this is, this is not satiric. This is actually a really uh, concerted long-term effort on his part to make a kind of, um, diagram of all of art history, in this case since 1959. Um, if you wanted to read more about this, this is a great book on this subject that I got several of these diagrams from. Um, uh, it's a German, has got lots of illustrations in it of these different uh, diagrams and trees. And then I just wanted to spend a couple slides on new kinds of timelines, things that are possible, uh, that are miscellaneous, kind of miscellaneous category. Um, I found a couple of looping timelines. So this is a timeline based on the London Underground map, um, which has its own history, by the way. It's a uh, it's very influential design of the uh, London Underground that's been copied by many cities. So this is a copy of the London Underground map, um, marked art history timeline. Um, and it's from a website called Lily Draws. Um, and you can see the red line, the, the main uh, center line, whatever, that runs through the thing. Um, from 1830 on the left to 2015 at the upper right. But the thing that's interesting about this is that it includes several loops. So on, in this detail, cubism is a dark green loop at the lower center. Um, and cubism leaves the main narrative and goes down toward the bottom. You see some, there's an analytic cubist picture down there and some captures. And then it goes back up and it joins the main narrative again around 1913 which is a way of suggesting that cubism kind of went its own way and then came back into the canon. And actually, as in the case of Ed Reinhardt, uh, we'll see in a couple lectures that this is not just the invention of this one artist, it actually reflects something that you can also read in art historical narratives, that cubism was a really essential movement, but somehow a little bit off to one side of the main um, narrative of art, which would be the red line um, in this one. And this is also an inventive graph because it turns that central narrative, the red line, into a graph, like a stock market graph, which rises slowly toward the right. I mean, it didn't have to, but that's the way that Lily Draws drew it. Okay, two more. Um, Multi-dimensional timeline. So, <laughs> okay, so this is part of a diagram of the plot of the German Netflix series, Dark. Um, if you've watched that, you would, might know how it is I end up finding this, because that is a seriously confusing series uh, with, a whole, with events that take place in many different um, time periods and 
multiple characters representing themselves at different ages and in different universes. And somebody made this map and, um, and put it on uh, the Wikipedia page for, for Dark. So what you're looking at here is the main timeline, a conventional one, which is the black line. You can see 1921 at the lower left. And of course, this is just a detail. You can see it goes up to 2053. Um, and one of the episodes is set in 27 June. Um, so um, different characters, plot lines loop back and forth in time. So the blue one and the red one, these are like orbits like around a solar system, but they cross the timeline, the actual time in different times. So they can zoom through at 2020 and come back in another year. And also there are some plot elements that exist um, multidimensionally. So there's a black line that starts from the upper left, Adam and Eve cease to exist and runs at a single instant, doesn't change through time, but runs across that way. So I have no idea if it would be possible to visualize art history this way, but it seems like a really interesting possibility um, to be multidimensional or multi-temporal. And I'll end with one last one. Here's art history in a way that nobody's ever seen it before. Um, this is a graph of Wikipedia entries for artists um, linked uh, by their cross-references. So this was uh, extracted from databases of Wikipedia. Time runs from left to right in each one of these. The top one is the English language Wikipedia. And so that is a map of 25,797 artist biographies on the English language Wikipedia at the top there. Italian artists are green, French are red, English are light blue, American is dark blue. So that's the top. And then the other, these other ones are different language Wikipedias. So the Japanese Wikipedia is the one at the bottom. And you see at the very bottom of this, there's a very faint trailing, uh, trailing, you know, scattering filaments of blue. Um, and that's Meiji era Japanese artists that are not in other Wikipedias. So this is actually, um, these are actually maps of art history as they appear in different languages um, on Wikipedia um, as a certain, you know, as a certain algorithm extracted them. So this is, this is the kind of thing I suppose that could be done with programming, but again, could also be done as an imaginary um, timeline um, because time in these uh, runs at a constant rate from left to right. So these are still timelines like all the others. Um, so I just, um, I have no particular way to end this particular lecture, except by saying that all of these are possibilities for timelines. And as you're, since you're, you know, all going to be subjected to ordinary garden variety timelines, it can be a good idea to keep these in mind and see maybe you might want to draw one for yourself.